Hey everybody, this is Kai Wehner from Confluent. Today my topic is mainframe integration, offloading and replacement with Apache Kafka. I want to show you how to stand up to the dinosaur. But no worries for the mainframe guys. This is not a mainframe bashing, but I will really talk about real world stories, how to integrate with the mainframe and to leverage the strengths of the mainframe and of event streaming with Apache Kafka and its ecosystem. The agenda looks like the following. First, I will talk a little bit about the current status of mainframe and what the challenges with that are. Before, I will cover different use cases for event streaming and for Kafka in on-premise and hybrid and cloud scenarios so that you can really understand where the difference between mainframe and Kafka are. Those are completely different technologies, but actually you will be surprised how common the scenarios and use cases are and how similar this is. And therefore, I will also talk about how to integrate the mainframe and Kafka with each other for different use cases like bidirectional communication, offloading, or maybe even replacement. I will end this talk with a case study about one of our customers who has done a mainframe replacement in the last years. Let's begin with the mainframe status quo and its challenges. As you might know, the mainframe is almost everywhere. Most business critical transactions are running on a mainframe today, still. So this is the banks, airlines, pharma, this is really everywhere. And the mainframe is built for mission critical systems. That's what it does very, very well. So it's not here to go, it's here to stay. That's the current situation. All big companies use it. So with that, let's explain what a mainframe actually is. So on the right side, you see a few different examples of these mainframe boxes. These are famous black boxes in the meantime from IBM. And of course, there is also older mainframes like you see in the picture at the bottom, but many mainframes are very modern and new. And this is also what you can see on the bottom right. So the IBM C15 is the current mainframe version, and this supports up to 40 terabytes of RAM memory and 190 cores. That's amazing, isn't it? Of course, this costs some million dollars for just the hardware, and this does not include uh, the processing of the software you run on it, so it's pretty expensive. But therefore, the big added value of a mainframe is that it's there for high reliability and security. So you can process events reliably, and therefore it's used for the mission-critical transactions you do, no matter in which industry you're in. It has huge features like hot swapping of hardware, zero downtime with the overall ecosystem and so on. From a vendor perspective, in the last years, people talked about IBM and the seven dwarfs. You will find several articles and blog posts about that because there was IBM as the leader and there were several competitors which also built mainframes. Today, this actually changed so in 2020 more or less. When we talk about mainframe, we really talk about IBM, right? And with that, let's take a deeper look into how to implement applications on the mainframe. Most of the applications running on the mainframe are built with COBOL, which is a programming language built in the 50s already as a business-oriented language. It's updated all the time, so if you take a look at the current version of COBOL, it also supports features like object-oriented programming. So it's not that old for everything, right? But on the other side, it's still from coming from a column-based punch card image format. So that's what you see on the right. So that was how mainframes worked 50 years ago. But um, it's not like that anymore. But still, if you take a look at these code examples and the editors, this is how you develop mainframe applications today, typically. So you have this column-oriented development, either in a, in a Windows emulation of a mainframe, like you see on the left side, or you can even use modern IDEs and development environments. Like in this case, Visual Studio Code, which also has a COBOL plugin. So the big problem of COBOL is, that's what I hear from our customers, is they have concerns about maintaining and changing features on the mainframe of COBOL code, mainly because the code has a lack of structure and has verbose syntax with also sometimes compatibility issues between the different COBOL compilers. And therefore, today, most people do not change COBOL code. It's too risky because it's running the most mission-critical systems. So they only add wrappers around it because that's less risk if you want to add a new feature. But it's, it's not really how you do innovative 
implementations of new use cases. And this is also one of the reasons why um, COBOL was isolated from the computer science community. So today, if you go to university, nobody is trained COBOL. And even 10, 20 years ago, nobody trained COBOL people anymore. So, so this is a, a big problem, right? And with this on the other side, um, while mainframes run mission critical stuff, on the other side, new industries and, and uh, companies are creating competition for you. In this talk, um, I will mostly focus on financial service examples because this is where mainframe is dominating everything, right? But it's really true, as I said, in many other industries also, even though I talk today about finance, financial companies mostly. So here you see a few examples of um, really innovative tech companies from, from Finsurf, um, like Revolut, Stripe, Robinhood, and many more, which are building new innovative applications. And with that, they are hunting the traditional banks and they are hunting them and they are able to hunt them because the banks run the most critical stuff on their mainframe. And the mainframe, unfortunately, is very monolithic and a proprietary ecosystem. It's not flexible. You cannot easily change things and scale it up. Uh, only, of course, if you order a new machine for a few millions. And so it's also very complex to, to, to operate this thing and develop new applications there. This is the current situation. And then if you take a look in the, in the market of 2020, and this is true for every industry, not just finance, you have to innovate quickly, build new things, try things out with A-B testing, throw things away if they don't work, simply to stay in the market. If you don't change, chances are very high that you don't exist in 10 or 20 years, even if you're a very big company. We have seen many examples in the industry, like, for example, um, Kodak for photo machines and uh, Nokia for mobile phones. And here is just one example of N26, a German new bank. So this is a great article at InfoQ where they describe how they are doing continuous deployment. So they are rolling out new features and trying out things every single day in production. And you can read about all these other companies in a similar way, right? So fintechs are doing these things. Cloud native, they are starting in the cloud and it's much easier than on a mainframe, of course. So this is a huge challenge if you want to compete with these companies. And in addition to that, also, many traditional companies innovate more quickly by moving to cutting edge technologies. Here's an example from Sberbank. This is the biggest bank in Russia. And I have visited them, visited them several times in Moscow in the last years because what they have done is really cool. So Sberbank has re-implemented their core banking platform around Apache Kafka and event streaming to be future ready. And future ready is not just to process more and more interactions, that's what you can also do with 40 terabyte of RAM on a mainframe, but really to elastically scale up and change things and um, adopt new technologies easily and um, scale it up in the cloud, hybrid deployments, all these kind of things. And on the right side, you see a few of the examples what they are building. And this is standard things, I would say, like instant payment platforms, but also more innovative things where you leverage machine learning for speech translations. For example, if you have conversations with your customer with a chatbot, and therefore, this is really huge. And it's not just about Sberbank, right? So this is about many companies. From a mainframe perspective, the answer to this is, well, um, our mainframe science is up to date from a hardware perspective. And also, it's not just COBOL code running there, right? And it's not just COS as operating system. That's actually true. So you can run more or less everything on the mainframe in the meantime. So in over the years, IBM added things like DB2, MQ, WebSphere. But in the meantime, you can also run Red Hat Linux there and deploy web services or even Kubernetes and continuous deployment and DevOps tools like Ansible. So actually, it's great, right? Um, and therefore, you could even deploy something like an event streaming platform with Confluent on Red Hat images, for example, running in containers on Kubernetes. So that's totally fine. And with a C15, you have a lot of hardware power behind that. So it's one possible option. So why not use only mainframes if you can do that from a technical perspective? Well, the short answer is it's about money. And that's one of the main reasons why people want to get rid of the mainframe. So of course, it's about complexity of writing COBOL code and changing it and so on. But in the end, it's all about money, right? So um, in the end, in the mainframe ecosystem, you only think about MIPS, million instruction per second, and about MSU, million service units, because that's how you get charged by IBM. And this is really about millions of dollars. So you pay for the processing power you use on the mainframe. 
And if you install software like a transaction manager or database, or if you run your custom developed application with COBOL or Java or whatnot, then you pay for these processing units and that's where the millions are going away. So this is the number one use case, right? So it's a business case to uh, offload data from the mainframe to save a lot of money. And what what's the other thing which should not be underestimated is the mainframe experts. So how many COBOL experts can you find to adopt and maintain and innovate with your existing COBOL code base on the mainframe, which exists for 10, 20, 30 years? There is not many. And there is a very current example now with Corona hitting everybody. In the US, there is actually um, um, the, the government wanted to share money with the poor people so that they can survive. But this has to implement, be implemented with processes under the hood. Unfortunately, the government, of course, also uses mainframes for this. And they are not able to implement this these days because they don't have the mainframe experts. And so mainframe experts is a real other problem besides money and besides complexity of the mainframe code. And because of these reasons, complexity, cost, and experts, we see huge demand from people who use mainframes for an open, flexible, and scalable platform to combine it with the mainframe technologies, to complement it, and sometimes to replace it. And some of these characters, characteristics are probably true if you are having mainframes in your ecosystem. So um, it's either about being more flexible or being more open, being more extensible. You want to deploy more globally, also hybrid with the cloud. Um, some of these characteristics are true for most companies. Often not all of them, and some of them are good on the mainframe, right? So the mainframe is also highly available and can process data in real time. But it has all these other limitations. And this is actually where event streaming comes into play, as we will see. Again, in this talk, I focus a lot on the financial service industry, but the same is true for telcos, pharma, government, and any other industry. In telco industry and in, in, in finance industry, we have so many customers, right? So, um, and here's just a few of them because these are all um, customers which run Kafka, mission critical. And on the bottom right, you see that they all have presented at a Kafka summit in the past. So you can take a look at these free video recordings and slide decks to understand all of their use cases. But what all of them has in common, that they are mission critical. So you, you see this is similar to mainframe. So they run mission critical applications. And therefore, event streaming in the finance industry and in other industries is used for traditional use cases. So fraud detection and payment processing, for example, exists forever, right? So that's not a new use case. But to take a look at fraud detection, in the beginning it was some business rules and then it was statistical models. And today you even use neural networks and autoencoders from deep learning to detect um, fraud. So it's getting a little bit more, more better from technology perspective and from the algorithms, but you still solve the same problems. On the other side, you build innovative new problem uh, use cases like the customer service with chatbots I mentioned before. So there is plenty of different use cases where you can leverage event streaming. And we see all of these deployments at our customers. Here is just one of our customers um, who specifically talks in the public about mainframe offloading. And they are really doing it to save millions of dollars per year. Point, period. So that's what they are doing. And you can read the case study from Royal Bank of Canada. And this is just of one of many examples where we do mainframe integration and offloading and replacement. Now, where you have an understanding of the event streaming use cases, let's talk a little bit more about the technology and how it's really different from a mainframe, but also how it solves the same problems. So Apache Kafka with event streaming, it's, it's under the hood, it's a distributed commit log. This means applications produce data to the log and others can consume the data. So this sounds like a queue, right? But this is very different than IBM MQ or, or similar systems because in the middle, this log is not just a messaging system like a queue. It's really also a store. So event streaming means the combination of real-time messaging from A to B, but also to storing the data. And, and this is huge because you can configure per topic how long you want to store the data in the log. And with this, consumers can either consume the data in real time or near real time, or maybe in batch, only overnight when you do a batch process. Or another application can consume the data via request response with a REST call from a mobile app, for example. 
And if you want to do analytics and machine learning, you maybe want to consume old data again and again. In this commit log, they are immutable and they are in guaranteed order with timestamps. So you can also consume old data. This is also often important for compliance and banking and other industries. So this is the core idea of the event streaming platform. And with this really decouples the different producers from consum and consumers from each other. And the other important part from the characteristics is that Kafka was built from the beginning for high availability and zero data loss. This means Kafka is a distributed system by nature. And with this, even if a broker is down or a disk is down or a network not working to a, to a broker in a data center, still the system is up running 24 seven. And this is really huge so that you can guarantee no data loss and continuously process the data. I will not on intro into Kafka today, there's other resources for that, but with these characteristics, you already see that there is very similar things to the mainframe pitch of the benefits of it, right? Even though the technology under the hood is very different. And here you see the overall picture of this underpinning of an event-driven architecture. You can integrate with many different systems, with a mainframe, with web services, with MQ, with databases, but also with machine learning frameworks, with a data lake, with a data warehouse, with custom applications in any language like uh, Python, Java, .NET, whatnot. And the, the key here is really that the event streaming is the central event-based system. This means that their events can flow through it in real time at scale for millions of events per second. But on the other side, because this middle thing is also a storage, it's also okay if, for example, a consumer is down and the producer still produces data. When the consumer comes up again, it can consume from where it left off before. Or you can also consume and reprocess all data. And this is really one of the huge characteristics of Kafka. And Kafka, as I said before, was really built for scale from the beginning. So you can process big data sets. And as you have seen before, this is not just used by the tech companies. This already was there 10 years ago. But today, every bigger company has several different Kafka projects in any industry. And even more important, it's not just for big data processing. Right? That's what some people and vendors tell you because they want to sell you another messaging system or so. But 70% of the people I see, and I talk to over 100 customers a year all over the world, is that 70% of the projects I see are actually not about big data sets, but about small and medium sized data sets. Because people process business transactions like instant payments with Kafka. And here it's not about terabytes of data. It's maybe about thousands of messages per second or maybe a, a few hundred thousand, right? But it's not big data like in Kafka terms. And still they use Kafka because of its mission criticality and scalability and capability to still do real-time processing at scale. And what I really want to point out also is this decoupling again. Because with Kafka, you can easily implement this domain-driven design, which means that on the one side you have the event streaming platform, but completely decoupled, you have many different databases or information systems or applications, microservices, whatnot. So here you see an example where in the middle we have a legacy payment domain. And here we integrate um, with an integration middleware to the mainframe. I will talk about that in much more detail in this talk. But on the other side, you also have modern applications, like on the right side, which are written in Java or C++ or any other modern technology. And then there is a business application, something like a Salesforce CRM. There you directly connect to that with Kafka Connect. So there's many different capabilities and you can integrate with anything, no matter which technology, and no matter if it's real-time or batch or request re response or whatever paradigm you use. And, and this makes Kafka so powerful because the core is real time, but still you can interact with other communication paradigms. And this is a thing I want to highlight once again. So Kafka was built for mission critical systems like the mainframe. So this is what they have in common. They are both built for use cases where you need disaster recovery and where you should never be down because it's processing the most important transactions. And therefore it's really important for you to understand what discovery means, disaster recovery means. So we are talking about the recovery point objective, the RPO. This means when an incident happens, and an incident could, for example, even be that a complete data center is down. What is acceptable and actual data loss for you? If the disaster happens, how much data can you lose? This is what you define with the RPO. And on the other side, the recovery time objective, the RTO, defines how long the actual recovery period is. 
How long does it take after this data is down until you can process transaction again? And these two things are important to understand and to discuss early in your project, right? Because this defines on how your architecture is, what products you use, how you deploy them over different data centers or regions. And of course, in the beginning, everybody says, I need an RTO of zero and an RPO of zero. In the end, I want to have zero downtime and zero data loss. Of course, this is the goal, but um, this is much harder to achieve. So let's take a look at mainframe and Kafka and how to do this. The mainframe has many different products for that. Um, the most modern one, I think, is IBM GDPS, which covers several different products which allow replication between different mainframes or even between different data centers. And with this, you have different options for disaster recovery. Um, the most important one probably is Metro, which is the synchronous remote data mirroring. Because this is important to understand, synchronous replication means that um, you really have zero data loss. Even if a data center is down, if you synchronously replicate it to the other data center, you still continue running without data loss. However, this has drawbacks regarding um, latency and regarding availability in over different regions because nobody can change the physics of be things being away and you have to transfer the data. And therefore, often you choose asynchronous replication for data mirroring. This means that um, it's easier to do, um, but um, it comes with the cost of you will lose data in case of disaster. Right. Um, there are trade-offs and depending on the use case, you make the right decision. But as you see in the top right, um, and this is from an IBM Red Book, you see that this is not a new question, but um, RP and O and RTO are common questions you have to ask yourself to define the right architecture. And um, with that, with a mainframe, then you use technologies like XCF or parallel suplex or hyperswap, and you combine that with your existing technologies in the mainframe, like a transaction manager or database manager, and that how it works in the mainframe. There is even other solutions. Of course, at IBM, you get many solutions, but this is, I think, the most modern one you see on their website. In Kafka, actually, the main idea is exactly the same. So um, in, in best case, you support zero downtime and zero data loss. And that what Confluent provides with so-called multi-region clusters, where you spin up one single Kafka cluster over different regions. And regions can really be remote from each other. Like we battle tested this feature with one single Kafka cluster stretched over the US East, Mid and West. So even if the West is down completely because of a fire or because of whatever the issue is, right? Um, your application still continue to run without downtime and without data loss. And you really have automated disaster recovery, not just for the server side, but also for automatic client failover. And this is really huge without custom coding. Because if you write something by yourself, you have to test this. And this is not easy to test and to implement and to maintain. So you see, this is pretty similar idea like with the mainframe. And here's an example from one of our banking customers. You see that we have a payment topic. So this is the instant payment platform. And this is mission critical. You need to process each message exactly once without data loss. So this is synchronous replication. On the other side, you have less important information like um, the logs and location-based services. This is not as critical. So this is what we replicate between the data centers asynchronously. But this is all built into the Kafka deployment with Confluent Platform. So you don't have to implement this. You just turn it on and this works for you with zero downtime and zero data loss. And this is really crucial and very similar to the main ideas of the mainframe, right? And with that, our customers then um, often build global event streaming ecosystems if they are working globally like the most Fortune 2000 companies do. So in this case, you have different options for an architecture. The same like you saw for IBM GDPS. So, for example, you can build one Kafka cluster for disaster recovery with zero downtime and zero data loss, like you see in orange on the left. This can be spread out, for example, all over the US. And then you can also replicate data to other regions, like another continent, with um, replication and cluster linking. So here you have separate Kafka clusters, but replicate data either in one direction or in both directions in real time with high availability and guaranteed order and all these things. And then you can also do aggregation use cases like you see in yellow, where you have, for example, one Kafka cluster at the edge in each factory or in each retail store. And you do the edge processing there for real time and low latency. But you also replicate parts of the data to a central cluster. This is what you see here in yellow in the big one. This might be your analytics cluster in the cloud where you ingest data from all the different factories or stores. And then you do your analytics on that. 
things like um, calculating um, issues in one retail store or by um, finding issues regarding maintenance of the assembly lines and production lines. Um, where you can also run a batch system behind Kafka, like Spark or something like a cloud machine learning service. And so that you're very flexible here. And this is pretty cool, right? And now as we have an understanding about how Kafka works under the hood and how it also relates and, and is similar to the idea behind mainframe for mission critical system, let's now talk about mainframe integration of loading and replacement. So first of all, um, why do you do that? Again, it's about complexity, it's about cost, and it's about staying competitive and innovative because otherwise your company might not exist soon anymore. However, unfortunately, the bad news is um, the Big Bang replacements typically fail. This is not just true for mainframes, but for any legacy technology you want to replace, especially if it runs mission critical workloads. So let's take a look at a few other options. First of all, um, this is one option which I think is very interesting. It's a, it's a tweet or a tweet story actually with several tweets from Brian Rimmeler. He talked about how he did an, an, a replacement um, or he, he merged the code of a full IBM system 370 mainframe. So this is the entire bank's mainframe COBOL code onto a Raspberry Pi and runs it there. So to be fair here, of course, um, a System 360 is a very old mainframe. It's not the System C15 right now, right? Um, and also um, this was not deployed to production on the Raspberry Pi, of course, but he actually had a business case for this. On the old mainframe, they had to recompile the COBOL code to upgrade it to a new version, but that was a big risk on this old mainframe. So they wanted to try it out somewhere else. So that's why he moved the data to the Raspberry Pi did the um, compiler upgrade there. And then after this work, they, they took the risk to do it also in the mainframe after this first test. And this is really an exciting story and you can check out this tweet story where he explains it in much more detail. This is just more or less a, an interesting side note, I would say. But now let's take a look more in the real world than most of you guys. Um, how could such a journey look like from the mainframe to hybrid and cloud architectures? I really want to point out, no matter if you just want to integrate both systems for offloading or for um, bidirectional replication, or maybe finally for replacing some of the mainframe stuff, um, this makes sense no matter if you really can or want to replace the complete mainframe or just integrate with it. So even a modern hybrid and cloud architecture can include mainframe parts, of course. The C15 is here to stay with its 40 terabyte of RAM for powerful processing. So. How does mainframe offloading work? Here you see an existing deployment of a mainframe on the left where you're running complex business logic with COBOL and you of course have some transaction managers and databases in the mainframe and you have some other legacy apps which also write and read and this is creating a lot of MIPS and MSU. So this is again this processing logic which you pay to IBM um, and this is where the millions of dollars are and this is depending on how you negotiated your contract with IBM and um, how your lawyers worked it out well and um, how the consulting companies helped you because this is different for every customer, of course. But um, it's very expensive, point, period. And therefore mainframe offloading means that you also push data out of the mainframe so that you can use it in another system. And, and this is where Kafka is a perfect fit because as I ex explained before, you can ingest the information from the mainframe and then you keep it in Kafka as event. And from Kafka then, everybody can use this event again and again, right? Either in real time or from a batch application or an analytics tool. And you can continuously read and write with Kafka because here are no MIPS or MSU. So this is completely offloaded. And this is how companies like the Royal Bank of Canada saves millions per year just by offloading data from the mainframe. And with this, of course, you can also be much more innovative because you can use new technologies and, and concepts building outside of the mainframe. And then maybe you can even replace the mainframe. There is no need all the time, but sometimes it, it's good to replace it, to only use the new technologies, maybe in the cloud. This is often not just about cost, but really more about being innovative and using the right technologies and also finding people which want to implement this because there is no more COBOL developers on the market. If you really do not just want to offload, but replace data without writing everything completely new, like Sparebank did, you can also use 
migration tools or code generation tools. Here is one screenshot how this can look like. Like you take all the COBOL source code and you have your magic tool in the middle and somehow it generates Java code. So most of these tools I know generate Java code. Um, the huge advantage here is now that this is done automatically and the Java classes or Java code then is a modern technology. It's compiled and you can use IDEs and analyze the code. You can refactor it. You can then rip and replace it or write some new functions and edit to that. This is much more straightforward with Java, even if it's complex COBOL code, which is merged, because then you can re refactor it with Java because there it's um, statically typed. And so if you refactor something in one function, all the dependencies of this function will also be changed. And, and this is why people want to go to such a new modern technology. And then, of course, with Java, this is also straightforward to integrate with Kafka, right? Um, so that's the easiest thing to do. So why does not everybody do this then? Well, um, the big problem with this tool is that often um, th there is 5% which cannot be converted automatically. And unfortunately, these 5% often are the most critical 5% of the COBOL code, um, which have the, the smart innovative processing logic, which you don't understand yet and can't change anymore. And so how do you get this out of the mainframe then? And if you can only run the 95%, which are not that important, then often it doesn't help that much because you still are dependent on the core part of the mainframe. It can still help because sometimes even this can reduce the MIPS, right? Um, because something is going out, out of the mainframe. But typically you can evaluate this, but often I've seen customers trying it out and it's, it, I, they are more skeptical about this getting working. And it's also, it's not that this, these tools are for free. So what we see in most of our customers is really that they integrate Kafka in the mainframe for offloading, for um, bidirectional integration, or even for replacement. So how can you do that? The number one concept I see for that being used is change data capture. This means you take a look at the changes on the mainframe databases or file systems and push changes like inserts, updates or deletes from the mainframe to Kafka in real time. So that's actually pretty cool because it really pushes data as soon as it changes and therefore it's a perfect fit for Kafka where you can um, then store and forward the systems to other real-time consumers. But you can also keep it there for batch systems or for reprocessing the data. And um, this already reduces cost a lot and it can also integrate with the different systems depending on your technology. It is fully supported by the vendor. And of course, it, it, it's also not for free, right? So change data capture is often used. However, there is other options. And even for change data capture, there is, there is different tools like you can either use InfoSphere data replication or short IIDR. This is the IBM tool for doing that. There's a lot of third-party commercial, commercial change data capture solutions like Attunity, which is now Click, or DBSH, or BOS Software. And all of these are Confluent certified vendors, by the way, and partnering with us on that. And um, there is, of course, other solutions, like there is an open source um, Debesium solution, but unfortunately, you still need the IIDR license. Um, or you could even directly connect with Kafka Connect and JDBC to the DB2 database of the mainframe. But this often um, creates too much workload on the mainframe and is not realistically possible because the mainframe operators will not allow it. And then there is also an IBM MQ interface often in the mainframes. This is another cool option so that you directly use Kafka Connect's IBM MQ connector to integrate with the mainframe without having any load or changes on the mainframe itself. And you can also directly integrate to the file systems like vSAM on the mainframe with many different tools. And then there is more exotic solutions like um, using COBOL and from there HTTPS to communicate with a Confluent REST proxy. This is possible. You could even run a, a Kafka client like Java or C Sharp on a Linux on the mainframe. Um, but here then always these questions comes up, who maintains it, how is it supported and, and do we really want to do this? So uh, the two common options I see are change data capture or um, really a native integration with a, with a good tool to directly integrate with the file systems or other technologies in the mainframe to also do bidirectional communication. So your task is in the end to evaluate the different characteristics like the performance. This is where we see some solutions really lack because they can integrate with the mainframe but not performant enough. 
And scalability is the same story and feature set. So how exactly can you integrate with the mainframe? Some solutions only can um, do change data capture from the DB2 database because they have a generic implementation for CDC from Oracle, from IBM and others. And of course, then this could also be done with the mainframe DB2. Um, but some others are much more powerful. I will show you one of these examples at the, at the end of the talk. And also, um, you need to watch the footprint on the mainframe. This is also key because this is where the money is. If you have more footprint in the mainframe, it costs more MIPS and MSU and gets more expensive. And also, last but not least, don't underestimate the politics. That's what I've seen at so many customers. So um, I've seen customers which actually didn't tell IBM that they want to offload data because this might then change how the next contract for the, the mainframe of a CPU workload uh, looks like. So they are directly going to a third party vendor for offloading without telling IBM that they are actually doing it. So this is often about politics also. So. After you have understood the different technologies to integrate with the mainframe, let's now take a look at a case study. This case study, as you see in the bottom right, is really from a bank CEO. And I have really seen this in the real world. Um, where one of our customers, the CEO internally had a public statement. This is the last five year where we paid $20 million to IBM for our mainframes. Get rid of that, dear mainframe integration team. So it was a little bit of pressure for the team, of course, right? Um, but this was an exciting story how people had wanted to off uh, to get rid of the mainframe because of the complexity because of the cost and because of missing uh, experts and also on the top left you see an, a great article moving to the cloud a strategy for banks this is a great paper by accenture explaining really why this journey from the mainframe to hybrid and cloud infrastructures makes sense to be more innovative and more agile and future ready and this is in the story, which happens to be in different phases. And so let's take a look at that. We have five years to get rid of the mainframe. What we use here, and this is a very common scenario in integration scenarios to integrate with legacy and replace. It is a strangler design pattern. As Martin Fowler already said uh, many years ago, the most important reason to consider such a pattern over a cut over rewrite is the reduced risk. So. A big bang replacement of a mainframe and all the mission critical workloads is, is huge risk. So people don't do it. They use this kind of pattern, start small by integrating with new systems um, and then go on and go on. And over time, you can remove more and more from the old dependencies, like in this case, the mainframe dependencies. And in the end, um, maybe you are really finished, like you see in the, in the right side in blue, all new. Or maybe you are only halfway or nearly finished. This is also awesome because then maybe um, you save 10 of the 20 million dollars, right? That's also great. So um, it's not always the need to go to the, to the all new. So now again, we have five years to get rid of the mainframe in this case study for this bank CEO. And here's the current scenario in the beginning. We have a core banking platform from the 70s running on a mainframe. And this is communicating with other applications and COBOL and so on. So this is direct legacy mainframe communication to the app. So in year one, we build inner integration to event streaming with Kafka to decouple the mainframe from the application. As we discussed before, there's many different tools which you can use here for the integration. And then after we have this decoupling, then the application on the right side, um, this can either also communicate with the new event streaming platform or also, of course, all legacy applications, if they are just COBOL, for example, they can still be on the left side and directly communicate with the mainframe. Both are possible options. And then over the next two to four years, we build new applications. This is either new business applications with Java or Python or .NET, which you build in a microservice style or something else, and you build them in a scalable, flexible way, cloud native, and they communicate with Kafka. But indirectionally, they also then communicate with mainframe data, right? Or it's also external solutions like a big data project with Spark or machine learning technologies in the cloud. They be directionally communicate with Kafka and with that also indirectly with the mainframe data. And then over time in year five, we can also replace the existing mainframe with a new core banking technology. That's the example like Sparebank did it. They built a completely new core banking technology. Often um, only some parts are ripped and replaced into new implementations and the mainframe can still run there for some of the parts, right? Um, this is how you want to do it. So maybe also replace it time over time to a new core banking system. 
But this is really how it works in many of our customers and they are in different stages. And of course, um, not everyone can do this in five years, but it takes longer depending on the size and complexity of your deployments and your future strategy. So this was actually my case study, but I want to talk about one more thing about transactions. I always talked about mission criticality, both for mainframe and for Confluent, because our customers are also doing mostly mission critical systems. So this is an overlap. Both can do it. So what about transactions? Well, if you're coming from the mainframe space, then of course, then the transaction is really the heart of your business application. When you do a payment, when you do an airline booking, um, when you do anything else. There's many different technologies in the mainframe. So um, one of the still fastest databases there is IMS, which is a hierarchical database. So very different than relational databases. And um, this is part of IMS. And also IMS has a transaction manager to guarantee these transactions. On the other side, you also have DB2 for a relational database. This then uses another transaction manager like IMS or Kix CICS, which is only a transaction manager and a little bit other stuff like a lightweight database with vSAM data sets. And so here you see um, there is many different products and, and no matter which one you use, um, most probably use all of them somehow. Um, this is how you solve the problem on a mainframe with databases and transaction managers to guarantee that everything is really executed and executed once or otherwise rolled back. In Kafka, it's working a little bit different. So therefore I have the transactions in quotes because Kafka is a distributed system, so there is no two-phase commit protocol. There is no transactions like you know them from IBM DB2 or IBM MQ because it doesn't make sense. A distributed system is, is very scalable and elastic, but therefore um, you cannot deploy standard transaction managers for that. It does not work and it does not scale and it, it, it's very complex and hinders um, new projects. Having said that, Kafka provides exactly one semantics since over three years now. So for a very long time and used by many of our customers. And exactly one semantics solve the same problem. They guarantee that if an instant payment is done on a mobile app, it's consumed and processed exactly once by each consumer application. Not at most once, not at least once, but really exactly once. So some define this as a transaction. And even if you take a look at the Kafka API on the left, we actually also use these terms of transactions in the API of the Kafka clients to even send more than one message and either all of them are, pr are processed or um, they are rolled back in the end under the hood. And on the right side, you see the architecture of the implementation of um, exactly one semantics in Kafka. Here you see this is also using concepts like a transaction coordinator or a transaction logs. But it's simply not a two-phase commit like in an IBM tool, um, but it's more distributed and more scalable, but gives the same guarantees end-to-end. -end. And this is what you care about, right? And with this understanding, um, then the last and most interesting question is, okay, great, so we have mainframe and we have new event streaming stuff, so how to integrate that? And not just for offloading, but really for bidirectional integration with referential integrity. So this is the most important thing about transactions, right? So keep all your data in sync with each other. And this is then where a middleware comes into play. Like in this example, one of our partners is BOS Software with their product TC Vision. Um, they are also working like us globally with all the different industries to implement exactly with mainframes and other systems like Kafka. And they are doing bidirectional integration. They are supporting not just DB2 or IMS, but also vSAM or Adabas and many other um, mainframe technologies. And they secure their referential integrity, even bidirectionally with these end-to-end -end transactions. So on the mainframe side, it's clear they integrate, for example, with the transaction managers like Kix or IMS, but also on the Kafka side, they leverage um, Confluent tooling. So in their case, they use librd Kafka, which is an open source client implemented in C for Kafka so that it's very lightweight and performant and robust. And this is used, including the exactly one semantics of Kafka, so that you have really integrity end-to-end -end in both directions between Kafka and the mainframe. And this is a huge example because on the left side, you still have the legacy stuff, maybe COBOL apps. And on the right side, you can build new stuff like a Java app or a Python app, or maybe integrate with other big data and machine learning tools. So this is huge, isn't it? And of course, here you see now, this is the scope of the middleware then in this case. So this is how these different um, vendors and, and partners work together to solve these problems. So this was the overview about how to integrate, offload, and replace mainframe with event streaming and Kafka. I hope this was a good overview. 
In summary, really for you to understand, both were built for mission critical systems and mainframes are also not to go away. They are still very powerful. But with Kafka and integration to mainframes, you can reduce the cost, really millions of dollars, but also innovate and build new applications much easier because the mainframe has complexity and is a monolith and because there is not many experts on the market for the mainframe. And that's very contradictory to Kafka and event streaming where every new university student wants to use this cutting edge technology. And with this, I also invite you to connect to me on LinkedIn or Twitter to stay in touch. And please share any feedback you have for me. Thanks for watching.